Thank you all very much for coming, honorable people of this land. We stand here upon Akkwan, the land of the Akkwan people here. You have to anikak away, yejitune. Kaak ye ha yati awe, ya ak kwan. Achawe ach tawasi go, slinget yu hatangi aya, utawa ahe. Ah. Slinget anikak awe uhan. Ye su yadu uhan, ke hanach tain, uch in hasati. We are upon this land of the ak kwan people there that we're working and living and staying here. That's why I wanted to hear it and I'm glad to hear it, the Tlingit language. And we are still here. We are getting stronger. We are together. As a child, I sat at my grandparents' house in Angoon and would listen to all these stories that were told of Raven, among so many other stories. People from the village would come around and tell these stories of that trickster Raven. And uh, I one time jumped up and started acting out every single character in those stories, which helped me remember them a lot longer than if I just sat there reading it from a book. And so too did the Haida. There were some Haida visitors that came to Angoon and told stories with my grandfather. And so I am glad to be here among you today. From time immemorial, we who are Slinget have lived upon these shores. These are the stories of old. For these are the stories which go back to the time of legend. 
Raven was walking along the beach. He was walking along and thinking, I am so hungry. I'm so hungry. Jay Wes, I want something to eat. And he, this is where he comes upon deer. And he comes upon deer and sees him and says, Hey, Achyakawu, my buddy, my partner, like friend. He's acting like they knew each other forever and a day. He sounds like a car salesman. <laughs> and he says, there's something hanging a little bit down there. There's like a bit of snot hanging there. And he reaches out and grabs it. And, and it's like, <laughs> he gobbles that up. But really, it was fat that he was having, that he ate. He gobbled it up quickly. He's greedy, that raven. And deer looked at him and was wondering, like, what are you doing, you silly bird? said, oh, let's go for a walk, friend. Let's get away from where the rock slide is going to happen. The heavy rain came down. The rocks might fall on us. Let's go over that way. Let's go where we're going to be safe. Deer was a little reluctant. He sat there and thought, I don't know. Why should I trust you? But Deer went along anyway and started walking along with Raven. Raven was hopping along and he noticed out in the distance a ravine. There's like a deep crack in the earth. It's not very wide, it was not wide at all. And there was an tr old tree that fell down on it, making for a makeshift bridge. But this tree was rotten. There was no, it was not good for anything. And Raven, he goes and looks at it, and he looks down, and he looks at deer and says, this is how we're going to do it, partner. We're going to cross this log, and we're going to go over to the other side where it's safe. We won't have those rocks falling on us. And deer says, I don't know. That log doesn't look safe at all. And Raven says, ah, oh, come on, you fart. Come on, you fart. It's OK. Nothing is going to happen to you. And Raven then starts going over it. He's flapping along. He's not really even touching the log. He's like just flapping along and said, see, look at me. Nothing's happening. Look at me, partner. Look at me. Ah, ah. He runs into another tree, and he's trying to gather himself up. And he looks back and says, come on, partner. Look, you can do it. I did it. But he just flies back over again towards deer, feet not even touching that log. He's a real cheater, that one. And then he says, come on, partner. Let's do it. See, nothing's happening. And Deer just doesn't know what to think. But if that rock slide is what he's talking about is true, he won't be safe on this side. So maybe I should go across that way. And so Deer contemplates it. He looks down at this deep ravine. It's a long ways down there. But if Raven can make it, maybe I can. So Deer starts slowly getting on that log. It's so rotten. He even feels it bending underneath him a little bit. And then as he's in the middle of it, the log breaks. Deer falls down. He falls down, and at the bottom, he dies. Raven looks down, sees deer has fallen, that he's maybe dead. And he flies on down, and he looks, and it's like, oh, my dear fart, my dear fart, my dear fart. I should eat you. Thus, the grieving period was over. <laughs> and he's like, where should I start eating you? And that's when he noticed deer's butt. 
really soft. And it started looking really good to him. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. <laughs> and then he starts eating away. And he's able to get through to the other parts of deer through this. And uh, out in nature, you'll see that as well. The other parts of deer are really tough. But from there, he's able to gain entrance. And maybe that's why he calls him my dear fart. And thus ends this part of the story. Good night, cheese. This next story of Raven and Wolf. This was told by my grandfather, George John Sr., Cog Wonton Box House. <clears throat> but it was also told by a Haida, Haida gentleman who came to Angoon on some visits. So I will tell this story. Raven again is walking along. He's sitting there thinking that the winter is coming. I don't know what food is left for me. Jay West, he's always hungry, that Raven. And he flies on up and he lands on a tree. And he's thinking, where could I find some food? Wow, 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 wow. And then he sees deer coming down the way. And he flies on down and lands in front of deer, startling deer. Deer jumps back a little bit and maybe tries to like scare, scare off Raven. But Raven says, my buddy, my partner, maybe we can go for a walk. And deer looks at Raven and says, you cr crappy raven. And says, I heard what you did back there. I'm not trusting you. And he has right not to trust raven. But then raven flies off and lands on a tree again. <sighs> wow, wow. Wow, wow. And he looks and he sees wolf. What is wolf doing? Wolf is trying to come upon that deer to try to take it down for his food. But deer is always alert to what is around him. And he pays attention. And wolf is never able to get him. And raven goes and lands a fair, a fair distance away from wolf. And he starts approaching. Hey, buddy, friend, pal. And Wolf looks at him. Oh, you're nobody's friend. You're not my friend. Get out of here, you silly bird. And said, I'm not trying to hurt you. I could never hurt you. And but Wolf won't take it. He charges at Raven. And Raven flies off and lands on a tree. So he then just is perched there looking down, watching what wolf and deer are doing. What are they doing? Raven has an idea. As he keeps watching, he sees that wolf is never able to get close to deer. Deer keeps running off. So Raven has this wonderful idea. What is this wonderful idea that Raven has? He flies on over, and he starts circling around above deer, diving on down and uh, uh, distracting that deer. And deer is getting very distracted. He's like, leave me alone, you silly bird. And like, oh, I'm just wanting to play. Come on, buddy. And he's flying and diving down and perching up on a tree, then flying on down again. And distracting that deer so much, Wolf notices that for the first time, he's able to start sneaking up 
on deer, sneaking up. I've never been this close before. That silly bird is doing something. And then he jumps, and he lands on top of deer, taking it down. Wolf starts eating. He starts eating away at the deer. And Raven flies and lands a few feet away. Buddy, pal. And Wolf is sitting there eating. And Raven's like, can I maybe have a little bit of that? I did help you catch him. And Wolf looks over while he's eating. He's like, you can have a little bit. So out in nature today, you'll see, and hunters may be able to confirm, that where deer may be, ravens are circling above. Ravens know when there might be a good meal to be had when they see the hunters or even wolves out there who want food. Because they know when the hunters clean and prepare that deer that some of it gets left behind. And thus, Raven is able to get a meal out of his little shenanigans in distracting deer and leading the hunter to deer. So, gunachtish. There were women who told stories quite a bit. I mean, raven stories. Oh, yeah. Raven stories, uh, raven as a woman. There are some stories of that. But um, a lot of the stories that I heard were also from my grandmother, who told stories at the various gatherings of Kuih. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. David. Okay. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts might be. It's such a recurring theme in probably every single Raven story that we've heard throughout this whole lecture series, and anyone who listens to Raven stories will pick up on how crucial and central the theme of Raven being ravenously hungry is. And I was just wondering what your thoughts might be on the significance of uh, hunger in these stories. Is it just because ravens are sort of always seen pecking around looking for food, or is there something uh, more than that? He's always pecking around looking for food. Um, I imagine it does take a lot of energy to fly around. And but there's also a story about that. Um, I think we have time to tell another. If anybody has any other questions, though, we could answer that. Okay. Yeah, I think we have uh, plenty of time. All righty. Okay. Raven was walking along the beach, just hopping along. And he notices off in the distance, there's a gentleman. He's walking over to the, the water's edge. And he puts this club he has. I'll call it a club. It might be a staff. He puts it into the water and says, I would like a king salmon. And a king salmon comes his way. And it comes right up to the man with that magic staff. It's very elaborately decorated. And that man takes out another club and boom, clubs it, then takes it for his food. 
Raven is noticing this, like, huh, that is something. And he sits back a while to watch this man in action through the days and weeks. Sometimes that man walks on over. I would like a seal. And the seal would come. And that man would then come with a club. Carve that up and go over to a fire and cook it up and eat it and maybe take a nap by that fire before heading home. Raven is noticing this. Hmm. What could I do with that club? I probably could get all the food I want. I have an idea, says Raven. When that man goes home, I'll see where he puts this magic club, the staff that he uses. And so he waits. The man goes home and he starts preparing his bed after yet another successful day of eating. He's sleeping. Raven moves on in. And he looks in, it's like, huh, he's asleep. He walks into the house. And he looks up, where could it be, this club? May this club come to me. May I use it to get all the fish I want. And he sees it. And he flies on up and grabs it and then lands back down. And he tips toe back out the door. And he goes down to the beach. And he puts that into the water. I want all the salmon that I could eat. I want all the trout that I could eat. I want all the seal that I could eat. And before you know it, all of these things start coming towards where Raven is. And Raven starts picking up that very staff, that club. He's not using a different club like the other man did. And poof. grabbing up all the things that were coming and running over and making a fire. And he starts cooking it all up and eating it as much as he could. At that time, though, Raven could only eat so much. And he's sitting there walking along, waddling really, like, oh, oh, I ate so much. And he says, maybe if I take a nap here by this fire, by on the beach, I can sleep some of it off and eat more, but not now. So he's looking pretty plump there, that raven. If Greenpeace were around at the time, they'd probably try to shove him in the water. And uh, this man wakes up. He's looking around for his club. It's not in here. Where did it go? Hmm. And he walks outside, wondering about his staff. Hmm. And he looks over, and what does he see? That raven lying next to a fire, sleeping away like he used to after a, a good meal. But he sees all the carcasses of all the fish and other things that Raven wanted and used his club for. And the man looks down and sees his club. He picks it up and looks at it. It's covered with slime. The paint is gone. Part of it was chipped. So it wasn't like it was before. He says, you crappy Raven. <sighs> I ought to get back at you. He puts it down, and he goes and finds a stick, and he makes a hook, and he walks over to Raven. Like, like, Stupid Raven. And he sticks it right in Raven's butt. And ooh, he's like, 
pulls out Raven's stomach and intestines. And he throws it by the fire. And he says, may it dry up and wither. And they dry up and wither. Raven still sleeping. I don't know how he could sleep through that. <laughs> but he does. So for the sake of this, he starts waking up. I'm hungry. I'm so hungry. I just had a big meal. What happened? And he looks down by the remains of the fire, and he sees his stomach and intestines. And he starts trying to gather them up, and he wants to try to put them back in. But they're all dried and withered away. They're useless now. And so he's unable to do anything with them. So whenever he's going around, because his stomach is gone, his intestines are gone, he's unable to be satisfied anymore. He's always hungry, that raven. It's also why, maybe why he's not fat. I ate one burger and I got a diet for a week. <laughs> but that's why raven is always hungry. Gunach cheese. Okay. So I get it that he's greedy, but where does the trickster part come in? Oh, he's Why only... Why does everybody... I mean, the greedy part is really easy for me to understand, but what is the trickster part about? He tricks people into doing things. He got that deer to, like, cross over a log. But it's still all about greed. Does it do nothing else, trickster-wise, besides greed? Oh, there are some things he's done that you know, sometimes we benefit from. But, um, yeah, we could go back to his birth and see how you know, he gave the world you know, the ability to use the tides. So, and he tricks a lot of things for that. So, but there are other things, like, and it's a good question to bring up. Um, what time do we have? <laughs> Do we have time for another? It's about 12.30, so we have okay. half hour. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell another one. I'll go back to the beginning. We'll go back to when Raven was born. Raven wasn't born at this time. There was a lady walking along the beach crying. She was walking along the beach, and she sat down by a tide pool and was splashing herself with water. <sighs> she's crying. That lady, she's crying. Her name is Kayiku Hek. And off in the distance, there's some killer whales that are coming along. They're coming along. You could see them in the distance. One of them had a hole in its dorsal fin. I think you call it a dorsal fin, the fin up on top. And he's coming along with all these other killer whales. To you and me, they look like killer whales. But if they took you with them and to each other, they look like humans that are in canoes. But what we're going to see are killer whales, not canoes. And one of them came out of the pod of the killer whales, and he stepped out and stood like a person. And he walked on over to this lady, what is with the tears, young one? Why are you crying? says, my brother, whenever I have a child, he kills it. 
or he has one of his servants do it, or one of his things do it, any time I have a child, he kills it. Yokiskuke is whom I am named after. And uh, I put that name aside and pick up my other name, Kajasti Ish, for this story here. And she says, he controls the tide. He calls it in and he calls, it, tells it to go back out. He controls it. And they become flooding tides. He floods the land. The people are afraid of him. So they all became his slaves. Gushtubuch sat there for a moment listening to her. I understand. We're going to do something about it. This is what I want you to do. When the tide is out, at its lowest point, I want you to go down to the beach, to the water line, and look and find a pebble. Perfect, solid, no cracks in it. I want you to take that and go build a fire. I want you to put it in the fire and heat it up. Pour seal grease on it. Think of your children, all that are gone, as you pour the seal grease on that fire. And when that stone is nice and hot, you'll take it out and put it in your mouth and you will swallow it, though it will not harm you. Something is going to happen. Hayekuhekes then agrees to this. She does as Gustuvuch says, and she walks down along the beach. Ah, the perfect stone. What did he say to do? I should build a fire and pour seal, put it in the fire and pour seal grease into that fire. So she does this. She builds the fire. Flames are reaching high. She puts the stone in there. She starts thinking of every child she ever had who were taken by her brother, Yokis Kukek. She names them all off, pouring that grease into the fire. And she looks after she named the last one. She can see the stone is glowing. It's so hot. And she takes it out. And it's like, she's nervous. Pops it into her mouth and swallows it. I didn't feel it. It was like he, that man said. She sat there and thought, what is happening? She started showing right away. She was, given, she was going to become the mother of Raven, that Kayiku Hig. She's going to give birth to that raven. And she's growing quickly. The time of her birth, giving birth, was going to come upon her soon. And she looks around like, I don't know what to do. My brother is going to find me. Kayeku Hek's mother was standing by. She said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go to an island away from your brother. You're going to go, and that's where you're going to have your child so that he doesn't kill it like he did the others. So she does as her mother says and goes off and has her baby on this island away from everybody else, away from her brother. None of the slaves of Yokiskukek can find her. 
He's not really worried anymore. But he doesn't want to share power with anyone. He wants to be the only one that controls that tide, making everyone his slaves because they're so afraid of him. She gives birth, and she's like, my goodness, my goodness, look at this. He's already starting to grow. And she puts Raven down. Raven is already walking. And every step he's taking, he's growing bigger and bigger. He's growing bigger, that Raven. Hayiku Hakes says, here, she gives him like a bow and arrow type thing. Says, I want you to learn how to hunt. I want you to be able to target things. Raven goes out and does as his mother asks. He's going around, going around hunting, shooting, practicing. And then he sees off in the distance a black duck. It's swimming along. And Raven's like, hmm, okay. Shoots that duck. Comes on over to it, picks it out of the water, goes back to shore. He looks at it. Starts cutting it open. Cutting it open, taking out all the meat, taking everything out, leaving only the skin and the beak. And Raven looks at it and says, Mother, come over here. She comes on over. I'm like, what is it, my son? You'll get into this. The suit made out of the duck skin. She steps on into it, and Raven starts sewing it up. And Raven says, May you swim out on the waters of the world. When the waves crash on you, may you shake it off. You'll shake it off and you'll swim safely on the world. And right then and there, Kayiku Hek runs out, jumps into the water, starts swimming along. There is a black duck out there. I don't know what the name in English is, but we don't eat it because there's a human in there. She goes swimming out into the world, and Raven is looking around. Hmm. Hmm. The waters are so high, he flies on up into the sky. He sees how high he can go. And he clamps onto a cloud. And he just kind of hangs there for a while. He kind of looks like a raven pinata, just hanging. Then he starts twisting around, twisting around. And then he breaks loose. And he starts flying back on down, landing on the ground. The duck comes back says, you need to go to your uncle. You need to go to your uncle. Ask him if he needs help with anything. Raven says, OK, mother, I will. May you stay safe. And she swims off for the last time. Raven goes on over, like, uncle, uncle, do you need help? with anything. My mother sends me here to help you. You kiss cake. Like, how did she have a son and I not know it? How did this happen? He thinks to himself. He doesn't say it out loud. He looks. Yes, I do need help, nephew. I need you to go down 
to my canoe over there. I haven't finished it yet. I need you to go and carve it out for me. If you can do that, you are indeed my nephew. And Raven says, OK. He goes on over. He looks inside the canoe. There's the ads. He picks it up and jumps inside the canoe and starts But then something happens. This is not an ordinary canoe. It's a canoe that kills people. It clamps onto them and breaks them in two. But Raven is made from tougher stuff. He's a fortress, that Raven. He pushes his elbows, stopping the canoe from closing in on him. But it's still trying to go. And then Raven just gives one more and breaks that canoe open, breaks it in two, instead of that canoe breaking him in two. And Raven looks at it like, huh, that was odd. And he goes back over to his uncle. And your kisku cake is like, ha, what are you doing here? And he says, I went to go do as you said, uncle. But that canoe, it tried killing me. So I broke it. Ah, Jay was anyway. <clears throat> OK. Nephew. You are indeed my nephew. I need you to go chop down that tree. That tree over there, I need you to cut it down. Raven looks at him and says, OK. I'll go do that. So he's hopping back on over. And he looks, this is not an ordinary tree. What is this that Raven sees? It's a tree that's made out of obsidian, volcanic rock glass, long pieces. Anytime somebody stepped under it, pieces of it would come down and kill someone right away. But Raven is made from a rock. So they just slide off of him. Like, rude. And he starts chopping it down every time. And it falls down that tree. And he picks up parts of it and goes back to his uncle. Uncle, uncle, I got it. Your kids cook cake. Oh, my goodness. What are you doing here? He says, I chopped down that tree like you said you wanted me to do. It tried killing me. Did you know about that, uncle? Your kids cook cake. No, I did not know anything about that. He's obviously lying. Ha! <sighs> what to do. So he looks out across the way. There in the bay, there is a large cave. And in that cave is a large oct octopus, a giant one. It eats people. And he says, I want you to go over to that cave. I want to have some octopus for dinner. Raven says, OK, uncle, I'll go do this. The raven is hopping on over. And he gets to that bay, and he sees the cave. And he's like, it's underwater, uncle. I can't get to it. And Yokisku Cake says, I'll handle it. Lower the tide. And the water pulls back. And it goes down. It goes down enough for Raven to walk into the water. He's walking along in the shallow water. And he gets to the mouth of the cave. And that giant octopus grabs at him, starts trying to get him. But Raven isn't killed that easily. And he's like, ah, become small, you giant octopus. May you become small. 
and it starts shrinking, that giant octopus. Soon, he's able to fit it in his hand. And he looks at it like, huh. And he puts it into a little bag. And he goes back to his uncle. Says, maybe my uncle is trying to kill me. I don't know. Now, the evidence standing there, yeah, maybe. And he gets to his uncle's place and says, uncle, I got it. And your Kizku cake is so angry. Hey, you silly Raven, what are you doing here? I got the giant octopus, like you said. It tried killing me. And he says, huh, ah, I don't see it. And he takes it out of the bag, throws that little octopus right in the middle of the house. Raven looks at it and says, grow big. And that octopus starts growing and growing. And soon, the house is getting filled with that giant octopus. Your Kizku cake is looking at his slaves, looking at everybody in the house like, get out, get out. And he's running out of the house himself. <laughs> and, like, and he looks at Raven like, I don't want it. Get rid of it. And Raven's like, but you said you wanted it. <sighs> OK, become small. And it starts shrinking again. And Raven goes on over and picks it up and puts it in a little bag. And he goes back to the bay and he throws it into the water and says, grow big. And it does. That giant octopus goes back to its cave. And so Raven stands there, kind of content with himself that he's still alive. And uh, Lucas Kukek, though, he's angry, that man. An angry man. He's a bad man, that Lucas Kukek. Ah, I'm going to kill that nephew of mine. He's standing by the bay. And Lucas Kukek says, may the tide rise. And the tide starts coming in in a big swell. And Raven then flies on out and lands on the tree. And he looks down and he sees the water still coming up. And he says, may the tide stand still. It stands still for a moment. He looks out across the way. And he looks out and he sees his mother in that duck suit. Yokizku cake looks out, realizes that this is her fault. Waves crash on her. A big wave came and landed on top of Kaiku Heik. But then she just <laughs> shook it off and continued swimming along. And he turned and looked back at Raven. You did this. Tides keep coming up. And the water started rising again. Raven flew up and landed on a tree. And your Kizku cake is angry. Winds, take him out. A storm comes in and is pounding against Raven, but nothing happens. And Raven flies on up, up into the air. He sees the cloud. He does what he did before. <sighs> And hang like the finata. And he's look, trying to look down. The waters are still coming up. The Klingit people, they start running up the mountains to get away from this flood. They're going up, and they see up there the glaciers are breaking apart. And when they're breaking apart, these rocks that were on top of it are crashing down on the mountain. The people are afraid. They're like, Atskani, they're going to kill us too. Tishklain, he looked at what was happening. I'm like, hmm. No, he says, the, the glaciers, 
They're helping us. They're putting these rocks there so we can build shelters against the tide, against the flood. We go and we must put them together. So they get up there and they start putting the rocks together. The waters are still rising. Bears are coming out. They're coming up the mountain chasing the Klingit people. The people are afraid. The bears are eating anything they can get. The waters are taking everything out. The Tlingit people have their dogs. They tell the dogs to chase away the bears, keep them safe, and they do. The waters keep rising. The Tlingit, there are some who jumped into canoes hoping to ride out the flood. They're looking. There are some who couldn't make it up the mountain right away. They didn't make it inside the rock nests. They weren't able to get canoes for themselves. They made ropes and tied them to the rock nest, tied them to the tops of mountains, hoping to, in desperation, to survive this flood. The water keeps rising. So many think at that this time died. They died in this flood. Raven is still hanging up there. Still hanging. His mother, Kayiku Heik, went on top of a mountain, on top of one of the nests of rocks, and is standing there looking down at this flood that keeps coming. Kayiku Heik is wondering when it will stop. Yokisku Heik. He's not going to stop. He wants that raven dead. But the water is even getting past him. He's going to do everything to kill that raven. And he looks up and sees his sister for the last time with his last breath. I will be reborn through her. And your kiss cake drowns in the very flood he caused it. The waters are still coming up. There's a man at the head of the Nass River. He's looking at what's happening. And he says, they're going to destroy everything. So he goes and makes some containers. He opens up one. May the stars come down into this box. All the stars go into the box, and he closes it and ties it up. He goes to the next box, and he sits there wondering of what he could put into it. And he sees the body of Yokiz Kuke floating along. And he points at it and says, may it come this way. May it become like a rock. And it comes over. Like, you will be called the moon. And he stuffs it into the box and he closes it and ties it up. Then he looks and sees the water so high. He looks up and sees the sun. He opens the last box. May the sun come down into this box. And the sun comes down into the box and he closes it and ties it up. The world is now dark. It's destroyed from what it used to be. Raven is hanging there, and he thinks, maybe I will land on a bed of kelp. And he comes and lands on a bed of kelp. And he's looking at the water, and he sees how everything is. And he thinks, maybe we can work with this. Maybe we can make it a better place. And that leads to what you already know as Raven and the Box of Daylight. The man had a good intention 
in the beginning to keep those boxes. But as you know, the rest of that story is about him releasing everything into the world and reforming it. And he made the tide so that it can go up and down all the time so that people don't have to be afraid anymore. And he says, may the tides come and go peacefully. And they do to this day. And that's why we have the tides. He tricked his uncle into doing all these things and learning everything his uncle did to make it happen. And so he let the world be as it is today with a steady tide. So that ends this story. Gunachish. But he also does lots of bad things. I think why Raven appears so much in the myth and legend is because he has that potential for good and bad, just like humans have that potential for good and bad. I think it's a bit of a reminder as well you know, that maybe when we deal with spirit, we need to try to keep it at bay. We do it by various means. You know, that raven talisman, it's not to worship the raven. It's hopefully a protection against the spirit that's out there. Just like at Ku'ir, when you go there during some of the heavy songs, in the old days, when the songs were heavy like that, the Klingit would lift up their hand against the spirit so that hopefully nothing bad will happen while well, that song is being performed so that nothing bad happens. And just like that, maybe that talisman, I don't call it talismans though. I don't know what else to call it in but that, so please forgive me on that, but that they keep it maybe just as a hopeful protection against spirit 
See, Raven, if you had everything in the world like your Kisku cake did, Raven would take it away and give it to the, to the world, and let everybody else have some. I think that's why Raven is great at reorganizing the world. The world was already here, but Raven goes and takes from the very rich and lets the world have access to it. He's like a Schlingit version of Robin Hood in that. I never thought about it before, but that, that talisman, I have one of those that Dave Galanin made, Memory Eternal. And uh, it hangs in my room. And whenever bad things happen, I go and hold it. And I hope that nothing bad happens. Just as I hope nothing bad, let nothing bad happen to you as you leave here. But even then, it's like we'll get through this together, just like we did the pandemic. Many people walked into the forest. They left us. But we are still here. Yesu yado uhan. Slingatani kauk owe uhan. Kehanachtzin. We are on Slingat land. We're still here. We are getting stronger. That's how it is among us. We made it here. When we take part in our traditions, we go to Kuih, we see the dedication of totem poles. We see the beautiful artwork like this. I suspect ceremonies took place for it. We are imitating our ancestors, they say. But when we imitate our ancestors, we're not just imitating them, we're embodying everything that our ancestors were. We're embodying what they taught us. We're looking at the world and we're thinking we can make it, and we do. We start saying the things they said. We do the things they do. But even though they walked into the forest ahead of us, because we do these things, they are with us. Our traditions are not just great testimonies of our past heritage. Our traditions, when we practice them, they give shape and form to the present. They help us, remind us of who we are as Slinget, Haida, Simchian people, the Nass River. All of us have that tie to it, the Slinget, the Haida, the Simchian. We all have ties to it. So when we're practicing these things, when we tell these stories, you're not just hearing me. You're hearing every ancestor, every storyteller. I told you in the beginning that I learned all these stories and kept them alive by acting them out. I became every character in every story for my grandparents. They were my first and biggest audience. It brought smiles to their faces as I acted them all out. And it kept them alive. So when I go out into the world and I see a place that reminds me of a story, I close my eyes for a minute and then I look up. The story is going to come alive again. Who am I? I am Raven flying up into the sky. I am every Klingit storyteller who ever lived. I call the end back to the beginning, back to the beginning of these legends so that we remember who we are as a people, that we have been here from time immemorial. And it's here that I leave the story with you. I'm glad that you all came to hear these stories. 
They are a history of who you all are as a people. So, thank you for listening to me. I had a point in there somewhere, but maybe you guys made sense of it. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, for the two stories to begin with, and then spontaneously telling two more to answer our questions. <laughs> um, just a quick announcement that our next lecture was scheduled for this Friday, but we've had to postpone that one. We'll have more information once we set a new date, so the next scheduled storytelling event will be from a Simshian storyteller, David Nelson III, on Tuesday, May 30th. And let's give David one more round of applause for those stories. Thanks, Chase. Mm. You want your things back?